This will be our 37th lesson in the book of Genesis. Moving right along through it, it's where this is an overview of it. This will be our third and last installment on a wife for Isaac. Our text is Genesis 24. verse 49 to the end of the chapter. Abraham's servant is at the house of Bethuel and Laban where Rebekah lives and we're in the midst of determining of them determining to send Rebekah with the servant back to Abraham. Servant Abraham has just relayed the whole series of events to the household, how Abraham was his master, how he was very rich, how his wife Sarah had given him a son in old age, and how the son was going to receive everything Abraham had, how Abraham had sent him out to his kindred to find a wife for Isaac, that he forbade him to bring Isaac back to Kate, back to the Mesopotamia, but bring the wife to, to Canaan. He relayed to them how he met Rebecca at the well, how he thanked God, how God had led him there. He's rehearsed all of that. He refused to eat. I mean, these people had come 700 miles by camel. He refused to eat till he repaid and relayed his message. Now having to said it, and now if ye will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing proceedeth from the Lord. We cannot speak unto thee bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before thee. Take her and go, and let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord has spoken. And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshipped. He worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah. He gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. And they did eat and drink, he and the men that were with him, and tarried all night. They rose up in the morning, and he said, Send me away unto my master. And her brother and her mother said, Let the damsel abide with us a few days, at least ten. After that she shall go. He said unto them, Hinder me not. Seeing the Lord hath prospered my way, send me away that I may go to my master. They said, We will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. They called Rebekah and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? She said, I will go. And they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and, their, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, Thou art our sister. Be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate, hate them. And Rebekah rose and her damsels, and they rode upon camels and followed the man. And the servant took Rebekah and went his way. And Isaac come from the way of the well, uh, High Roy, for he dwelt in the south country. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant ahead said, It's my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. And Isaac brought her unto his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Amen. Quite a saga. <coughs> I'm taking time as he goes through here to make a point that we are being acquainted with God in this Genesis record. This is not a history book. 
It does contain history. But this book of Genesis contains history of 2,500 years of history. And there's just one man that it really emphasizes. So God's not writing about just what happened in the world. He's writing what he's done. And this is how he prepared how he prepared for the coming of the Savior. See, sin had so blasted the human race that a lot had to be done before God could even talk about a Savior coming into the world. Amen. Thus far, he's not said anything about a Savior coming into the world, and we're already 2,600 years into the history of the world. And there hasn't been anything said about a Savior, or about redemption, about salvation. Why not? God couldn't talk about it because people weren't ready. He's going to have to institute a whole, le a whole law system with sacrifices and definitions of right and wrong and telling people you got to do what I tell you to do when I tell you to do it, where I tell you to do it. You've got no choice in the matter. He's going to teach them for 1,500 years just that before Jesus could come. But in these records, we're being acquainted up to this point with God. The real, we're talking about the real God now. We're not talking about fictitious God. There's been several, we might call them episodes of human history that's been covered up to this point. Man sinned. Divine judgment was instant. They didn't live five minutes longer in the garden. That was it. This is the real... This is the real God now we're being confronted with. God hasn't changed. Amen. Then murder was committed. Cain killed Abel. And divine judgment was ministered. Then the whole world plunged down in the imagination of man's heart was evil from his youth. And God said after the flood the same thing existed. Judgment came down. He destroyed. The, this is the real God. Now we're talking about the real God here. The whole world except for eight souls was destroyed. And we saw how men got together. They got together, had a perfect unity. God himself said, nothing shall be restrained from them they imagine to do because the people are one. They're going to build this city and build this tower to make a name for themselves. And God said, not going any further. That's not what I want. I don't want man making a name for himself. Yeah, yeah, that's going on today all over the yeah, place. Right. In religion, too. It's, oh, yeah. yeah. God's letting you know this is, this is how he feels about it. He hasn't changed. So he did confused their language so they couldn't understand each other and dispersed them and the building stopped. Well, that's what's happened in the church, isn't it? People can't understand each other. Christians can't understand each other. So we've got all these different denominations. Nobody understands what the other one's saying. Why not? God did this. The church got skewed off in the wrong direction, said God said, that's it. I'm going to make it so you folk can understand each other, and then you won't be building any great religious empire in the world. Amen. That's, that's what's happened. Yeah. Amen. God's going to address it. It's, God's not done, done working. He's not done working yet. That was revealed back here in Genesis. Abraham's called to be the progenitor of a great multitude of people. God's going to culture a special people among whom Jesus is going to be born. Hey, Jesus couldn't be born in Rome <laughs> or, or, or Alexandria. Why not? Because they, these people in that area weren't cultured to know God. So he cultures the people. They were, they were not an ideal people, but the culture. It was the kind of culture Jesus could be born into. It's the kind of culture Jesus, when he's 12 years old, could prefer to talk to the doctors than to go to the youth meeting. Jesus could never have been born in the United States. <laughs> he did never grew up like he did. That's why, the, that's why God called Abraham, to develop a race of people that would have the word of God, have prophets, have the temple, have a sense of God, and Jesus could be raised up in the midst of that. Then God promised a special land to Abraham because God was going to take these people and he's going to cut them off from everybody else. This is the real, now this is God that did this. Amen. Cut them off from all other people, gave them a special land so he could work with them. 
Then God affirmed that Abraham had eight sons, Ishmael the first, then Isaac, then six took Keturah, but only one of them was the heir, and God taught us God does the choosing. If you, <laughs> you think you do the choosing, well, you're like, you're just wrong. That's all. We could, if anyone wanted to argue that man does, I mean, we could put them. We could put that down. I mean, yeah. bury him in the ground. I mean, I, we understand that this can be disproved, but he's teaching this. I'm the one that decides who my heir is going to be. Right. And even if Ishmael's first, Isaac's going to get the blessing. Even if Esau's first, Jacob's going to get the blessing. That's the way God is yeah. teaching us. And he kept Abraham in the land. He didn't let Abraham move anywhere else. He never went back to Mesopotamia or the Chaldees. Not even for a visit. <laughs> he didn't go back and visit the family. No family reunions. Amen. Well, I'm telling you the truth. Now, this is, just, this is just scripture. Under the law, you had a family reunion. It was a Jewish. It was the Jewish people had their gatherings together. Then he wouldn't let Abraham even to buy a piece of property. He could only get a piece of property to bury his wife in. So he had to he had to live in the land that was promised to him as though as he was a stranger. Yeah, right. That teaching us something here about see salvation. Before you get to heaven, you got to learn to live in a strange country as a heavenly citizen. And if you don't learn to do that, you will not go to heaven. That's what salvation's all about. See, all this is introduced in the Genesis record. Now, in all of these accounts, which I just briefly summarized them, God's unfolding an understanding of himself. Like in the creation, you see that God is the creator. He's the one that makes things. Nobody else can make things. And Adam and Eve, you saw... Humanity was created, it's not the result of an evolutionary process. He was given dominion. He lost it right off the bat. Uh -huh. But he was given dominion, which means man is superior to the rest of creation. Yeah. The rest of creation is slotted to be in, in subjection to the man. And we introduced to the serpent, Satan. We're used to him right off the bat. There's an enemy. There's an enemy afoot in the, in the land where Adam and Eve sin. That reveals a human capacity. These are the only two innocent people that ever lived in the history of the world. And the very first time they had a chance to sin, the, I want to emphasize this, the very first time they did. God's telling you something. God did not make man to be independent. Not even Adam. So you learn about God there. You learn that God has the right to impose death, to impose death. All men die. We don't die because we sinned. We die because Adam sinned. We've sinned too, understand. But death was imposed because Adam sinned. God has a right to impose a curse on a lot of people because of one people, one person. Got a right to do this. And he has a right to bless a lot of people because of one person. <laughs> Hallelujah. To bless a lot of people because of one person. This is how God thinks. He thinks different than men. In Satan, uh, in Satan being bruised, we learn that God holds out a promise, and you gotta you gotta hang on to that promise and ride the storm out. And we learn that uh, even though this apparent error. Abel was killed, God raised up a substitute, Seth. And we have no idea how many sons Adam had. The scripture just said he begat sons and daughters for 800 years. So we, we, but it must have been a lot, but God, Seth. In the flood, we learn of God's wrath. In Noah's being saved, we learn about God's salvation. Tower of Babel, we learn that God doesn't accept just any unity. In Abraham, God is a primary person is always chosen. In his day of salvation is Christ. We learn of substitution was introduced when a ram was offered up in the place of Isaac, you remember? And messianic lineage was established through a chosen seed, through an Isaac shall I see be blessed. These are all things about God that were revealed, see? 
And lo and behold, in our day, a lot of them have been, uh, have been lost. Now, when it comes to apostolic doctrine, the prophetic language, the prophets also, they confirmed that this God is everything that is depicted in these accounts. Let me give you a few of them. This is the Psalms. The kingdom is the Lord's, and he's the governor among the nations. Do people really think that God lets you elect who's going to run your country? Do you really think that? Some people do. But he's the governor among the nations. He, had, he hasn't abdicated. He raises up one, puts down another. You got a lousy country, he'll give him a lousy president. That's what happens. I'm just, I'm just telling you the truth here. The Lord is most high, is terrible. He's a great king over all the earth. There's no place he's not king. Here's the testimony of God himself, Isaiah 45, 7. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Evil in this case isn't moral evil, it's calamity evil. That tornado that swept through here, God said it. There ain't no tornado can be spawned without God. I think you'd find, if you were to follow the path of that tornado, I think if... You'd find out there's a lot of stuff that had to be taken out in that part of town. Hey, what about the innocent people? They'll be compensated. Yeah. God won't forget them. He's just. He's just. Amen. The Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Mm -hmm. So one kingdom he gave to Hitler. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, well, that didn't seem right. Well, it all depends on what, what God's doing. If he's chastening his people, well, maybe that's what's happened here in our country. Maybe the church is sloughed off, and so God's just raised up a persecutor to wake them up. It's the way God is. Nebuchadnezzar said after he went to school, I praise and honor him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He doeth according to his will in the army of heaven among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay or stop his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? What are you doing? Amen. Or in our problems, why did all this happen? Yeah. Well, tell people, you need to really like shut up. Amen. You've got no right to ask a question like that. God, he has purposes in serve. His purposes are not going to be against his people. Yeah. Understand. Amen. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. There's one lawgiver who's able to save to destroy. All these affirmations support what was lived out in the book of Genesis. Now, let me proceed with the text. Yeah. You said that we die because Adam sinned. Not because we sin. I thought we live eternally because Christ took it away. That's right. By Amen. one man sin entered into the world. Also by one yeah. man it was taken away. Amen. And we live eternally because of that. Amen. Yeah, that statement is made in Romans the fifth chapter. So that wasn't like a human conclusion. Yeah. <laughs> yes, by one man dead death entered. Yeah. Seventeen things that you uh, mentioned here, they unfold in divine purpose. Each yeah. one of those now, they're big headings. Oh, you yeah. spend an incredible yeah. amount of time on each yeah. one of those now. Mm -hmm. Every one of these... I. I feel safe in saying it this way. Every one of these has been jumped over mm -hmm. by <laughs> religious men because they've been focusing on other things like the institution. They right. missed all mm -hmm. this. That's right. That's right. They've been reading it pretty much like a historical yes. document, yeah. and they missed all this. Yeah. Really, yeah. you might they might have mentioned some of this a little bit, but they they've missed yeah. all this. Use it for their own purposes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, that'd be without excuse. And then as history as history proceeds, this. This is underscored even more. They get bolder and more expansive, but the root of it is right back here. <laughs> All right, here's Abraham's servant. He's going to ask him, tell me yes or no. They've already said take her, but uh, that's not sufficient because he had received a mandate from Abraham, but two things had to happen. The woman had to be willing, yeah. uh -huh. 
and the kindred had to be willing, and neither of those had been addressed yet. Servant is sure it's Rebecca, but he's still, I got to have these two, two things have to have. I got to get the consent of the kindred if they will, if they will let her come, and I got to get consent of Rachel. That's what he's seeking here now. And he asked him a telling question. Now, are you going to deal faithfully and graciously and truthfully and lovingly and mercifully with my master? Well, how's that for transferring the, <laughs> transferring the weight? Well, you're talking to someone about the Lord Jesus. You said, now, are you, going to, are you going to honor God, bless God? Or are you going to reproach God by rejecting what I'm saying? Yeah. You've got to lay it, yeah. put it down there. That's right. Tell the people the issues. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and we can, we can tell you an authority of God himself, the holy prophets, Moses, Jesus, the apostles, that God does not take kindly to man rejecting what he offers, Amen. just in case there's any questions about it. You may be patient, but you're not sure if God will be or not. He may bring the hammer down. So you've got to make that be made known, put some, put some stress on it. When seeking the fish for men, after we've established what Jesus Christ has done, you know, what, what salvation is and what God has offered and so forth, it only remains whether or not the hearers will receive what's been given. So tell me now, while I'm still here, I'm not going to send you home to study about it and read your Bible about it. I've told you the truth now. Now tell me now, Choose this day, right now, choose this day who you're going to serve. Amen. You know, that's kind of pushing things. Well, being as you don't know what a day will bring forth or whether there's going to be a tomorrow, it sounds to me like this, we really don't have any alternative but to do this. You try and you do it thoughtfully and considerately, I understand that, but this, you Tell me whether I have to. Tell me whether I can stay and expound these things to you, or I have to go down the road to the next house. Tell me, let's tell me now. Joshua demanded an immediate decision. Yes. Elijah demanded immediate decision. Jesus demanded immediate decision. He said, "Follow me." He didn't say, "Go home and think about it." Yeah. You had to make it right then. You had to decide to do it. So I know. So you. So I know what I'm supposed to do. In other words, I need to know whether my journey ends here, choosing Rebecca, or if I had to move on down the road to some other relatives. Now, Bethuel, that's Rebecca's father, he was one of eight sons born to Milcah, who was married to Abraham's brother Nahor. So we got seven other sons. You could visit. <laughs> Huz and Buzz, Kemuel and Chase said and Hazel and Bildash and Zitlaf. And then there were the sons born to Nahor's concubine, there Teban and Gahem and Thahash and Maacan. So there's a uh, bride could be found in several households, so do I need to keep looking? You got to see the resoluteness of this servant here. See, he's not—he's not trying to sell something. You pick up on this. He just is told. He's not trying to pressure them by salesmanship. He's just telling them, "This is my mission. The only thing I got to determine is if this is worth, if Rebecca's the one or not." So we don't need to try and find out what qualifications Rebecca have to meet and so forth. That's how we've already—that's already been determined. So you tell me whether I should go or whether I should move on. Now, one thing you learn about this, that the Lord's business, there's a certain urgency that pervades the whole thing. There's nothing, nothing, nothing about God's work that is casual and haphazard. Amen. It's all done with a sense of urgency. Amen. One time, our Lord Jesus had gone to a desert place to be alone. And the people came to him, sensing that he was about to leave the area. 
and they tried to keep him from leaving them. That's how the NIV reads Luke 4:44. 4, they tried to keep him. Now this is Jesus we're talking about. I want to understand. This is Jesus we're talking about. He tried to keep him from leaving them. He said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also because that's why I was sent. I wasn't sent here just to you. That's got to come across to every soul. Jesus didn't come just for you. Quite frankly, that wasn't worth the trip. You know, I, saw it. I don't know about that. Well, God told Jesus the Jews weren't even worth the trip. He said, it's, a, it's too small a thing to give you Israel. I'm going to give you the heathen beer in here. <laughs> That's Isaiah 49. Yeah, I'll give you the heathen, see? So the, salvation is a big enterprise. Amen. This enterprise of uh, finding a wife, this was a big, uh, big thing. And Jesus, his coming to the world is a big thing. And here's a... A lot, these were a lot of people. This wasn't like a family or a couple of inquirers. They walked around the sea. He ministered among them. He left. They walked around the sea and said, stay. And he said, no. He said, I got to preach. And then in the next verse 44 says, he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. He had a lot of work to do. So once the will of the Lord's known, see, a casual spirit, it's like it's out of order. It's just wrong. Not to press toward the goal with relentless zeal. People ask questions like, do I have to do that? I mean, does the Bible say anywhere that I have to go to church twice in one day? What does it say I have to go at all? They say, well, no, it doesn't. But when you think about the salvation of God, like you explained to me why you don't want to. Whenever a glance, whenever alliance with others is mentioned in the scripture, it's always with those who are like precious faith. Whenever believers tied up with somebody, it was always someone of like precious faith. They never tied up with someone that wasn't that way. <clears throat> so you tell me, he said, whether I, whether I had to move on or not. Laban and Bethuel, Laban, Rebekah's brother, Bethuel, her father, Answered and said, The thing proceeded from the Lord. We cannot speak thee good or bad. It's amazing. There was no Bible. There was no Ten Commandments. You could take everything God had said that's recorded in the Bible and put it on a couple of pages at this time. And these men knew more than the people living in our generation. They had more of a sense of God. In those spiritually primitive times, they had more of a sense of God than the church has in our day. Absolutely amazing. The thing proceeded from the Lord. They recognized this whole thing. This is from God. This trip was from God. This message is from God. This choosing Rebecca, this from God, this whole thing is from God. So, well, they said it's from the Lord, and the Lord's all in capital letters, you know, it's all capital letters. Wherever you read in the English Bible, the Lord, Lord in capital letters, it's the translation of, of Jehovah, or Jehovah, it's a Jewish word. And the Jews, they, they took this commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, and it, they were so conscious of that, they were afraid to say God's name for fear that they'd mispronounce it or lose it loosely. And so they didn't say it or write it. It abbreviated it some way. This is, this is how much fear they had of, of God. Well, we understand that, but that's the Jews. But if you have Bethuel and Laban saying Jehovah, <laughs> this is something else. This, this Abraham must have done a remarkable, remarkable amount of talking about his call. Yeah. Must have been very impressive, because God didn't appear to any of Abraham's brothers, yeah. and certainly not to any of their children. 
Yet they're talking about the Lord. Amen. So what they understood, they understood about divine government. They understood that when God mandates something, it's got to be done. Amen. They didn't dare contest it. When they say we cannot speak to the bad or good, what they're saying is we can't give our interpretation of this. We, yeah. we're, not, we're not free to interpret this. We just, we just got to believe what you said here. We can't interpret it. Yeah. We can't try and figure out what God meant. Mm -hmm. We're afraid to do it. That's what they were saying. That's what they were saying. Now, what if people reason like that today? What if you went, you went you talk, you're talking to a good old solid Baptist, you know? And you say to him, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And they say, Yeah, but yeah, be saved before you're baptized. None of them will ever say, That was of the Lord. Yeah. Unless, they're, unless they're not a Baptist in their heart. Amen. They won't say that. See, are you condemning them? No, I'm condemning that way of thinking. Mm -hmm. There's other subjects we could bring up that be more, more close to home. <laughs> be more close to home. Like the people advocate, they're solid advocates of baptism, but they never talk about holiness, mm -hmm. without which no man shall see the Lord. Yeah. Why don't they? Because they're interpreting. Yes. These men wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. We can't tell you. Now, I don't like to have to talk like this, but I want to say it anyway. That under the watch of modern preachers and teachers, with a host of Bible colleges and seminaries, a phenomenal lack of God consciousness has developed in the Western world. It's not because we didn't have enough preachers or teachers or Bible colleges or seminaries or commentaries or Bibles. That isn't why. Something very bad has happened. The wrong message has got out. Instead of the message that God is God and you are subject to him and repent and believe the gospel, instead of that coming across, people are haphazard about it and think they have a right to have an opinion about what God requires them to do. Now there is estimated that there are, are 335,000 churches in America with 4,000 new ones every year and 3,500 to 4,500 close every year, so it's kind of a washout in numbers. These 335,000 churches have 312 million church members. That's about 43% of the population of the nation. These are by name, I understand. When I say church members, this is by name, confession. And the percentage of active church members is smaller than that, of course. Now with all this religious activity, the fear of God is almost nil. I mean, everybody knows this, don't they? Is there anybody that doesn't know this? We're now in the fourth generation of young people that hardly know a thing at all about God. They're at an intellectual level of chimpanzees when it comes to knowing God. How did that happen? How did that happen with all the spiritual resources that God's made available to this generation? How did it happen? Somebody wasn't faithful. That's how it happened. Somebody didn't tell the message. Somebody wasn't like Abraham's servant. He told the mission. He told what the objective of the mission was. He said, I can't stay here till this thing's done. Well, that's a tragedy, isn't it, of our time? If such a mindset exists, but it does. And uh, I appreciate last Wednesday, Brother said he confessed some of the sins, you know, of our generation. Yeah. That does need to be done. Amen. Remember when Daniel was in Babylon, he, he calculated from Jeremiah's prophecies the Babylonian captivity was about to come to an end. He set himself to pray. What did he do? He confessed the sins of the people. He hadn't sinned. He confessed the sins of the people. 
Ezra, he's with an expedition going back to Jerusalem, and he confesses the sins of the people. Nehemiah, he's building the walls, and the people, they confess the sins of the people. They confess we're where we're at today because your people, God, dropped the ball. They confess it. Some, somebody's got to do this. Somebody in, somebody in religious history has dropped the ball and led us astray. So that's to be confessed before God. Question. Um, in, in Genesis 22, at the end of that chapter, he, they received news yeah. about his brother. So could, could they have had some kind of an ongoing communication between well, them? Some, there was some means of mm -hmm. communication. It wasn't, they weren't physically with each other, but right. yes, there was some means of communication. Yeah. I just, I just wonder, because the reports that they would yeah. have gotten back would have been very favorable. Yes. Yeah. That God was with Abraham. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. So it could have, we don't know who it was, but it, it, yes, there was some kind of communication yeah. taking place, yeah. Now I want to say a word at this uh, point about what's the age called the Enlightenment. It took place in 1650 to 1800. It changed the whole landscape of Christianity. Now, it, quite frankly, it was a reaction to Catholicism and to stereotyped religion. That's what it was a reaction. So they kicked... They kicked Revelation, the idea of God ordering people, he kicked that out, yes. kicked religion out, yes. and he vaulted human reason. And you know what, the, what nation was the first nation founded on that kind of thinking? Does anyone know which nation it was? Ours. It was our nation. Yes. Our nation was the first nation developed on the hypotheses of the Age of Enlightenment. It said man has the answer. Man can come up with a solution. Man can do it. Personal autonomy. That's right. Mm -hmm. I don't think the pilgrims, when they came, they didn't have that in mind. Yeah. Yeah. The ones that framed the country, they did have that in mind. Yeah. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. Where'd that come from? Yeah. It didn't come from the Bible. The Bible says man was made to seek God and find him if happily they might feel after him and find him for he be not far from every one of us. That's what God said was the purpose, but see? Uh -huh. yeah. He said life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in this world. That's what it's all about. That's not what it's all about. Amen. The age of enlightenment came in. It exalted human reason. Then's when the Bible, all the different Bible versions started. We started to have different Bible versions. And you'd have notes like, this is in the best manuscript, this isn't in the Bible, no, all, what they call higher criticism. It all started, and with all of that, there was a shift mm -hmm. in the way Christians thought. Yeah. And we're living in the aftermath of that shift. Well, yeah. <laughs> I think of ways to say this because it, it just sounds like you're some kind of a cultic <laughs> leader when you say it, but this this is the way it is. I'm just, I'm still working on how to <laughs> how to phrase it. Now they have to say that they we can't say anything one way or the other. He says, Rebecca's before thee, take her go, let her be thy master's wife. But he but a lot's happened thus far. The servants arrived at the proper place, the well he found out I'm at the right place. The proper woman came. The initial qualification of the woman was confirmed. She's a, her kindred is Abraham's kindred. Provisions were made for him at Bethuel's house and for his servant, for the servant, the men with him and their ten camels. And the kindred have consented now to, to Rebecca leaving. So there's all but this one, this one thing remains. We got to have the consent of Rebecca. They said, "Let her be thy master's wife," as the Lord has said. Mm -hmm. He could said, "All right, that's good enough for me." But he remembers Abraham said, "If she's willing, mm -hmm. if she's not willing, mm -hmm. don't bring her. You're free from your oath. Mm -hmm. Had to be willing." Now, this is a type, of course, of uh, of the gospel of Christ and how it works. Yeah. When the gospel is preached, those who believe it consider it a message from heaven. 
from God, even though it was delivered by man. You know, it came from God. Now notice how this is expressed in Scripture. The message came by men, but God is the one that sent it. Now we are ambassadors for God, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ to be reconciled to God. Galatians 4.13 Ye know that how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first, and my temptation which was in my flesh he despised not and I rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Jesus Christ. Yeah. Here's Second Thessalonians 2.13. For this cause also we thank we God without ceasing, because that ye heard from us which ye heard from us, ye received it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which affects he worketh in you also that believe. Now this is how the God works. There have been times when God thundered out of heaven, but this like isn't a standard mm -hmm. mode of operation. Jesus said to his disciples, He that heareth you heareth me, and he that despiseth you despiseth me, and he that despiseth me despiseth him that sent me. So God takes personal, how every person responds to the gospel is taken personally Amen. in heaven. God will look at a person who doesn't believe the gospel, and he rejected me. He rejected my messenger, which means he rejected my son, which means he rejected me. People need to be told that. Amen. This needs to be preached from pulpits and thrown into evangelistic campaigns. Just to make it clear, you, you want to do it as graciously as you can. I understand it. We're not trying to beat people up, but people need to know. Look, what we're offering you here, this salvation of forgiveness of sins and a new heart and being reconciled to God, this is all very real, but if you don't receive it, that's not the end of the matter. God's going to take it personal. So we exhort you. We admonish you. With many words, we exhort you. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Hey, that's, a, that's how Peter approached it. All seen here right here in this text. So after they've said, here she is, what does the servant do? He, see, he connects this with God right away. He connects it with God. He bows his head to the earth. He worships behind his head to the earth. It's the second time he's done this. I remember when, he, when at the well, I remember he found out Rebecca did what he asked God to have her do. And when she did, he bowed his head and worshipped. He worshipped. Here he hears the consent of the house, Bethuel and Laban give their consent. He worships. Worships. But see, we live in a day when this word worship, like people have a strange ideas about what worship means. Yeah. It's become very fashionable now, worship. But what, what people call worship, this isn't what the Bible calls worship. From Matthew through Revelation, various forms of the word worship, worship, worshiped, worshiping, worshipers, worshiper, is mentioned 29 times. Of the 29 times, five of them refer to idolatry. There's not a lot of references to it. There's no instruction on it. There's no Bible doctrine on worship. That's right. yeah. there, there isn't. Yeah. No place where it tells you how to worship, unless you worship in spirit and truth. But that's not speaking of a routine. Yeah, amen. See, I come from a religious background where one segment of the denomination worshipped by routine. There was five acts of worship, and these five acts of worship had to be in everything you did. If the five acts were there, then you were worshiping. Now, they didn't get that from the apostles or from Jesus or from God or from anybody else. So I want to just take a moment about uh, worship, what it means. There's a variety of different words for worship in the scripture. I've written down here what they are. You can look at it at your leisure. But given a summary of worship, it involves an outward manifestation, bowing and kneeling and falling down. And sometimes people just, they did, just the fact they did that was constituted worship. Then there's humility, a spiritual posture, bowing the head before God. Whether they said anything or did anything else, that was when that was done from the heart, that was that was worship. Mm -hmm. Then there's a service, subservient to it. But as soon as you recognize God, it's like, what will you have me to do? 
where would you have me to go? And that's the most prominent use of it. It's also used of honor and respect of God. Now let's take a word to point out how worship was under the Old Covenant. Under the Old Covenant, there was a worship called the service of God. It was a tabernacle worship, the temple worship. The people didn't worship in this sense. Sometimes the people would all worship, but it was, a, it was outward falling down. And the word used for worship, which is called the service of God in Romans 9, 4, and some of the other versions do call it the worship or the true worship. The word used means service. And in, the only people that worshiped God in service were the priests. The Levitical order. They're the ones that worship God by his service. The people didn't do it. The people weren't the worshipers. The Levites were. They did it. And service was the accent of that. Uh, of that. You remember how that uh, when Satan tempted Jesus, saying he'd give him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and Jesus said, "Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, for, he is a, for, for whose name is jealous. He is a jealous God." And Luke, uh, Matthew says. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Serve. Now when Jesus said to the woman at the well, she said, where should we worship? You, you worship in Jerusalem, and we worship over here. Where is, the, where is the proper place to worship? And Jesus said, there ain't any more profit, pro, pro, profitable place to worship. Neither here nor there. That's what he told her. But we're going to worship God in spirit and truth. That's a whole new dimension now. It means the worship comes from within. And it's according to truth. In conformity with, God, with who God is and what he, what he requires. In other words, the worship is a result of perceiving God and recognizing what he's done. And worship is the response of it. <laughs> That's right. Now this is involved when I'm coming on worship here to show how different it was from back then. Not because God has like changed the definition, it's because since sin's been taken out of the way, now we can get on with with this kind of thing where it was impossible before. You remember there Paul said to the Romans Romans twelve, he says, Present your bodies a living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. Yes. Some of the other versions say worship. Our worship is our life. That's right. That's right. Right? That's what your worship is your life. It is. It's not a routine, it's not a particular day of the week. It's your life. You're presenting your life as a thank offering to God in worship. Amen. See, that didn't exist back in, in this day here. <laughs> but they had a sense of the greatness of God, so they humbled themselves. Paul talked about worshiping God with the Spirit. With the Spirit. With His Spirit. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, you know, the Jews... They would draw near to God with their lips, but their hearts were far off. Well, that was just the opposite of what Paul did. He served God, like you said, from within. With That's right. Now, those who do this know what we're talking about. Those who don't, don't. <laughs> but if you, you know what, I, what I'm talking about here. Actually, the worship of Abraham's servant was closer to New Covenant worship than Old Covenant yeah, worship. Yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. See, Israel was described, here's how Israel, God described Israel as stiff-necked, rebellious, stubborn, perverse, and crooked, and forward. Now, there's still people, they think the church is like this, so we're just like those Israelites. 
God tells us to do something and we don't want to do it. You know how it is. I hear this preached all the time. If I had a slingshot, you know. This kind of stuff is wrong. If you're like the Israelites, then you're not born again. God doesn't call the church perverse and wicked. See, at the point they're perverse, they're not church anymore. They're, they merged into the world. He has to call out to them like he did to Corinth. Be separate. Come out from among them and be separate. He said this to the church. 2 Corinthians 3.18. Come out, be separate. Then I will receive you. I mean, he hadn't, he not, hadn't received him. He had, but he wasn't at the time. Yeah, that's right. Because their condition. Ironic, this man, he had none of the revelation right. we have. <laughs> I know. Worshipped in spirit and truth. That's right. And now the, the nominal church has all this revelation, and they haven't risen even to the point of Israel's worship. That's right. Really. Yeah. really. Mm -hmm. At best, at best, they're still there in their form. It's remarkable. No godliness. It shows you that faith... Faith is not bound. In That's right. Amen. Amen. That's right. Well, Someone, given today, yes. they have this idea, they say, called praise and worship, where it's like a switch. They just turn it on and turn yeah. it off. It's not a, they're, they're not living their life for the Lord. They just come in at one point and try to, well, it's not a switch. You can't do that. Well, they're taught, they're <coughs> taught that in praise and worship, that'll compensate for all this other It'll make up for it. In fact, you've been living way out there in the left field. You just get praise and worship, then God will overlook that and come down to you. That's what they teach. But it's wrong. Look what, look what it's produced. I mean, you, you don't have to really spend a lot of time on this. So what did, he, what did the servant do? Well, he gave jewels of silver and gold. He brought forth a lot of precious things. I gather that the distinction of the gifts given to Rachel, they, they appear as though they were more valuable than the others were. He even brought raiment. This is outer raiment. It was of a costly sort. Now this again is a type of Christ in the church. As soon as you make an agreement, the gifts start. Amen. The gifts start coming. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the gifts you get by this shall all men know you're my disciples if you have loved one for another. That was a gift that you got from God. Precious jewel. See, believers, professed believers who look and conduct their lives no differently than the world do a great disservice to Christ. If salvation doesn't make an outward change in you, you're not really going to try and tell us it made an inward one, are you? I mean, do you really think we're that dumb? That you could be changed inwardly and it not affect you outwardly? Because the spirit of man, that's what makes him what he is. And he gave, uh, gave them to Rebecca. Well, just a small portion of what was going to be hers. I mean... Abram was going to give Isaac all he had, and Abram was very wealthy. He just gave her a few. Really, what we've got now from Jesus is compared to what we had, it's a lot. But compared to what we're going to get, it's very small. Very, very small. It's a first fruit. It's like a handful of fruit compared to a field of it. That's right. Amen. You can see that, kids. You're the and he gave gifts to his her brother and mother, brother and mother. See, God has got a lot of stuff. Some people who are really not the chosen ones get some benefits yeah. that derive from the Christians. There's some businesses that are afloat because there's Christians in it. Yeah. Yeah. That's like distributing some <laughs> jewels. You got a bank on this too. Ask God where you are if you're working uh, for another organization of some sort of business or something. Make this a matter of prayer to God. You're praying that some of the th some of the things that He's blessed you with, some of that will spill over, so they'll kind of see. 
See the way Sister June and Sister Eva have noticed this, and they, they other people notice it too. Where they work, the business has kind of picked up and been doing better since they're there. That that happens. That's like distributing some jewels to the mother and brother. Now, that's a reproach to Christ when cheap things are offered as a result of of what God has done. They present like a, some cheap bauble that you could get at a doctor's office or you could get out of a medication bottle and they offer that up is what God did. You see, oh, they offer something a little bit better than that. Some precious jewels. So they ate and drank. Remember, he has said he wasn't going to eat till he told him his mission and we're, we're down. All this is that before they eat. Now they, he's told them the mission. They've got he's got their permission, and now they eat and drink. Remember when the servant arrived, he asked Rebecca, "Do you does your house have enough room for us to lodge in, and, and our camels?" And she said, "Yeah, we have, we have room for you to lodge, and we have room for your camels. Straw and provender for them too." But Laban hadn't told this. Uh, the servant hadn't told this to Laban and Bethuel. He didn't say, and I, I asked her if he didn't relate that part. He wanted that to voluntarily yeah. see, come back to him. That was like a sign. Sign to him. But Lodge, the idea of the word lodge, as I understand, is spend the night. He didn't plan to stay, but overnight, that was all. Yeah. He would conduct his business and get back home. Then send me away means with your blessing, with your benefit, let, let's not let anything be between us now. That, let's not leave with a rift between us. And I'm sure that included giving them some provisions. So that, in other words, he said, don't, don't detain me any longer. They said, this old, my business is done now. And their brother and mother said, well, let the damsel, damsel means young maiden, let the damsel abide with us a few days, at least 10. Come on, come on. They knew they would ne may never see her again. You know, her whole life, they may never see her again. They said, give us 10 days. That said, that ought to be reasonable. But uh, this was a mission for somebody else. <laughs> this wasn't the servant's mission. This was Abraham's mission. So he says, don't hinder me. Hinder me not. Seeing the Lord has prospered my way, send me away that I may go back to my master. Look what's happened. God's blessed my way. You can't bless it anymore. Don't hinder me. Don't slow me down. Now. Don't slow me down. Well, in my lifetime, I heard to say that to some close friends. Don't slow me down. Come on now, I find when I spend time with you, I get kind of sluggish. How many of you notice this? Some people you're around, you kind of get forgetful and spiritually sluggish. What should you do? Get up and be on your way. Don't hinder me. Just say, don't hinder me now. Unless you got a word from the Lord. I like the fact that he was willing to put his stomach on hold. Yeah, he, uh, until he got business done because Amen. that was he didn't want to get he didn't want to get sluggish either. Yeah, that's like, right. You know, and get all full and then <laughs> and God you know, and then relax. But yeah. he was you know wanted to stay on it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. When I get yeah, this weekend. done, yeah, yeah, his God wasn't his belly. Remember some people like God was their belly. Put put oh, the flesh oh, off. Put the flesh <laughs> off. <laughs> Now that's the manner of the kingdom. This reflects the manner of the kingdom. Don't hinder me now. I got, I got business now. Don't, don't slow me down. Now here's what Jesus one time he called a young man to follow him. He said, "Follow me." The young man responds, "Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father." So it was a matter of social and domestic concern. We don't know. It appears as though his father may just have died. We don't know for sure. Just Laura? 
Nehemiah saying I'm doing good work and I can't come down. Put yeah. them off the wall. That's right. Amen. Amen. Surely the Lord will consider this. I mean, it's my father, you know. Maybe I'm the oldest one. My responsibility. Jesus says, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Amen. Why did he say that? Because he had said, follow me. That's why he said that. Right. And follow me means now. Yeah. Amen. Amen. He told James and John, follow me. It meant then. Right. You've got to leave your nets. You've been working on your nets. Amen. Mending your nets. Yeah. Leave them. Amen. Andrew and Peter, same thing. Follow me. He had to go. Uh -huh. Matthew with the seed of custom. Follow me. He had to get up. Yeah. As soon as you sense in your heart, I need to get closer to God. Yeah. Huh? I need to be making some progress. Right then is the time to start doing it. Amen. Now. Chrysostrum is interested. It's a saint that lived back 347 to 404 AD. So that's kind of early, you know. I was interested in his remarks about this response to this young man. He said he might need, if he went to the funeral, to proceed after the burial to make inquiry about the will and then about the distribution of the inheritance and all the other things that followed thereupon. And thus waves after waves of things coming in upon him in succession might bear him very far away from the harbor of truth. For this cause, doubtless, the Savior draws him and fastens him to himself. Amen. A pretty insightful remark, wasn't it? There are some associations that Satan designs to be introductory, get your attention, and then fasten upon you. Then there was, uh, Jesus spoke about preaching one time. Crowd went and tried to keep him from leaving them, and he said, I must preach the gospel to other cities. I gotta, I gotta go. I have to go. Then there was Paul's word to the Initial word to the Ephesians. He went to Ephesus with, and he was with Aquila and Priscilla. He left them and entered in the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And his time in the synagogue yielded some pretty good results. And they asked him to stay a longer time with them. Paul said, he, he says he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep the feast that cometh to Jerusalem, but I'll return again unto you if God will. And he sailed to Ephesus. And I tracked there all the things that happened. As a result of that choice, he was put in a position where he got a free boat ride to Rome. And Jesus told him he was going to testify in Rome. And a lot of good things resulted from that. If he had stayed in Ephesus, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah, that's right. Then when he did come back to Ephesus, they had this uproar. In, in Acts 19, that led to his trial and standing, before, ultimately standing before Caesar. But it would have been premature at that first time for him to stay there. So he left. A man driven by a single purpose will shape his life around that purpose and finally realize the fulfillment of it. That's a purpose that came from God. Now, in your heart, you've got to come to the point where you say, it's heaven or bust. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I'm going to go to heaven. doesn't make any difference what it costs. Now, whatever it costs you, now you'll be duly compensated. I mean, you, you're, you'll never go in the hole. Yeah. Let's put it that way. For following Christ. Amen. So they said to him, all right, they, they consented. See, God's working in this. you got to see God's working in this, bending the heart and the will of these people. They said, we will call the damsel and quiet her mouth. Let's see, let's see what she has to say about this. Now, that, I don't know if she was there at the time he'd been talking. It, it suggests that maybe she wasn't there. If she wasn't there, she, this would be the first time she knows anything about becoming a wife. Because the, the servant hasn't told Rebecca about her being a wife. <laughs> Far as she knows, he just he's on a trip there. She didn't know what it what it was. 
So that would make this all the more, her, just, her answer, would, that would make her answer all the more impressive. So they called Rebecca and said, will you go with this man? It is now this man has given us a pretty impressive set of credentials. He's told us about why he's here and all the good things that will befall you. He didn't, they didn't just, will you just this man? Will you go with this man? So as I say, if she'd been within earshot of this, it'd still be a hard thing to do, but she may not, this may have all been sudden revelation to her. Now you must know that we're living is in times when people have lethargic minds. They can't think fast, make a decision fast. And one of the reasons is the many errors that have been taught in the name of Christ. They've come up with some wrong conclusions. I want to, I want to just mention briefly some things that you had to make up your mind now when these things happen. Yeah. When Israel had to cross the Red Sea, they had to decide. <laughs> yeah. When Moses said, forward, that, that's, that's all the word you got. You better move out. Yeah. When Hezekiah received letters from Sennacherib, mm -hmm. who def soundly defeated bigger nations in Israel, he just had a short time. Take those letters and take it up with God right away. He did. The impotent man and lame people that were commanded to walk, they weren't told now in the morning, if you've got a good nice rest, give it a try. See if you, see if you can get up. They had to right there decide to get up right there. Yeah, it's one thing to read this in the Bible now. It's another thing to... Put yourself on that. Here you but you had never walked. You're 38 years old and you never have walked. Yeah. Here comes a man and says to you, not only pick, get up, walk, pick up your bed. Yeah. Now you got to decide right then. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to give it a try. The man with the hand. And he right. couldn't stretch it out. But the moment they wanted to do this, then the power came to do it. Amen. See, why is it some people? Don't make much progress. They never decided to do it. That's why. Because at the moment you decide to do it, God sends power and enables you to do what you need to do. Amen. As is the day, so shall your strength. That's right. Yeah. When Peter is walking on the water, he, he actually did walk on the water. He's the only human being, aside from Jesus, that walked on water. How far he walked, we don't know. 10 feet, 20 feet, 1 foot, we don't know. But when he began to sink, he didn't have time to say, Lord, it's good, good for us to be here. It's a beautiful day today. But yeah. He had to think right now and right now before his, you know, how fast do you sink when you start to sink? Before his head would, started going underwater, he said, Lord, save me. Yeah. Amen. A lot of people, that's why they're not rescued, see, brethren. Yeah. Amen. They don't call on the name of the Lord. They linger and try and swim their way out. When the Holy Spirit said to the church at Antioch, separate to me Barnabas and Saul. They had to do it then. They couldn't uh, hold a board meeting about it. So they asked her, okay, Rebecca, what are you going to say to this now? She says, I'll go. And this is of that magnitude. See, the preparations of the heart and the answer of the tongue are from the Lord. There it is. The Lord moved her, see. I will go. I only met this man yesterday. This is the day after. I only met this man yesterday. But I'll go. I'll go with him. I was thinking about this talk <laughs> the night before. She, had, yeah, she has oh, yeah. had a little bit of time over to look, <laughs> look over those tokens. <laughs> Amen. See, she wasn't like the horse and the mule. Yes. The scripture says, Be not as the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held with a bit and a bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Don't be the kind of person the Lord has to give you, give your jaw a yank to get your attention. Yeah. Oh, don't be that way. She wasn't that way. She doesn't ask for some time to think about, well, let me think about this. This is a big decision, you know. I have never been away from home, and I may never be able to come back, and I've got to think this over. 
And everything she's known has been learned in the last 24 hours. There was no time to take a home school's course on this. But behind the scenes, God was turning her heart like the rivers of water. Now, it's not by coincidence that those with whom God are working are end up willing. It's not, that's not coincidence. They're willing in the day of his power, as Psalm 110 says. So they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse. And Abraham servant and his men. Now, Rebekah's nurse is named later in the 35th chapter. When she died, her name was Deborah. She apparently was assigned to Rebecca when she was born and was kind of an assistant with her and probably taught her a lot of things and while she was raised up. Now this is how the Jews took care. They see they were an agricultural society. So there was a lot of work and all this that had to be done. But this is how they made sure their children were raised raised right. It's just, it's just kind of interesting. They assigned some faithful servant mm -hmm. to take care of things that, uh, while Rebecca was uh, busy of other affairs, and they sent her along with sent her along with Rebecca, the nurse. And the nurse didn't say, "Do I have to go?" You know, I mean, I mean, I've been in the house for a long time. She just understood. She yeah. was. She just understood that where Rebecca went, she went. You do remember that Paul described himself as a nurse, don't you? He said to the Thessalonians, Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, as we might have asked a lot of stuff from you. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse. So actually, if you, if you can see it now, you've been given a nurse also, yeah, amen. we give an unseen nurse, the Holy Spirit, uh -huh. and there's some person, godly person, that to you is like a nurse. Amen. This is how God does things. He makes sure you're not out on your own, particularly when you're growing up. Now then he pronounced a blessing upon her. The first blessing is quite staggering. Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions. <laughs> Let me give them some other versions because it evidently was a hard, hard expression to translate. Thousands of ten thousands, that's the New King James Version. The NIV says thousands upon thousands. New Revised Standard says thousands of myriads. That's another word for thousands. Jerusalem by uh, Jewish Bible says mother of millions give you many children of grandchildren contemporary English God's word many thousands tens of millions Messrs Bible what what does that language mean is that's not mathematical language that is not mathematical language that's the same thing as saying without limits Amen. that's the scriptural phrase because see people they, they didn't have a concept of Something that's limitless. Uh -huh. So we so talk like this in order to kind of develop that concept. Now notice how often this kind of language has been used to Abraham. I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. Yes, yeah, same kind of. If you can number the dust of the earth, so shall thy seed be numbered. He limitless. He brought him forth, said, Look into heaven, tell the stars, if thou art able to number them, he said, So shall thy seed be. See, it's the same, same idea. Limitless. The angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. Yeah. Whenever you think of what God does, you got you can't circumscribe it by human boundaries. Amen. Yeah. Abraham, and blessed oh bless thee, I'll multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sea that's up on the seashore. Use the phrase, many nations would come from him. <coughs> And in the, in the glory, we see the saved in the, in the glory, the saved. We behold him a great multitude which no man could number. 
of nations and kindreds and people and tongues. Limitless. Limitless. God's people need to think in terms of limitless. No boundary. No extent to which God cannot go. Now this is said of Jesus' offspring. Remember in the 53rd chapter, the chapter prophesied of Christ's death. And then of his exaltation and intercession for the trans... Closes with saying he would make intercession for the transgressors. In the 54th chapter, continues, speaking about Jesus, continues by saying, Sing, O barren, thou didst not bear. That's Jesus. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not prevail with child. For more are the children of the desolate, as Jesus, who had no earthly seed, than the married wife. In What are we going to do? Enlarge the place of thy tent. Let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not. Lengthen thy cord. Strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth of the right hand and on the left. Limitless. You say, how many people are going to be saved? More than you can count. Yeah. Amen. We don't because we see a picture of them in the heaven. Uh -huh. So that's the kind of blessing. They're saying, we, we can't think big enough. We just... Without number. Thinking without limits. Here's a text from 2 Corinthians 4.17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Or how about the exceeding riches of his grace? How about the working of his mighty power? See, it's all language that denotes limitless working by God. But this idea, Laban and Bethuel had this idea in their minds of something that transcended human comprehension. That's remarkable that back in those times that such a thing was, uh, was known. Well, Rebecca rose and her damsels, hmm, and her damsels, and they rode upon camels and followed the man. They didn't say, uh, could you leave us a map so we know how to get there? The only way to get there was to follow Abraham's servant. There's a parallel in Christ Jesus. You want to get to heaven, you have to follow Jesus. Amen. Here's what Jesus said about this. John 12, 26. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, oh, maybe I better not read that. That's too incriminating. Well, let's read it anyway. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. So if where Jesus is, you aren't, then you aren't a servant. If where Jesus is, you are, then you're a servant. That's what he said. That's what Rebecca, she, where, wherever the servant was, that's, she, she was in this case a servant. He was the leader. She was there. Now they're traveling along. <laughs> Incidentally, we, Rebecca was accompanying Abraham's servant to the destination. We are accompanying Jesus. Jesus is not accompanying us. Huh? We're accompanying Jesus. We're following him to the destination. All right, they're traveling along. Now the scene shifts. Isaac came from the way of the well Laheroi. For he dwelt in the south country, and Isaac went out to meditate in the field at, at the evening tide, even tide. This well of La Her 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 Heroi, that's the well that Hagar found. Remember when the Lord opened her eyes, there was a well there? That, that, that's, where, that's where it was. That's where she gave a name to the Lord. The Lord is the God that sees. Isaac had been at that well. <laughs> maybe that reminded him as you're there God sees maybe he's thinking about his coming wife you know and maybe God give him some insight into this 
So he's meant there. Actually, he dwelt in the south country. We assume that was Beersheba. But here's what God's doing. God's arranging things so that Isaac's path and Rebekah's path will intersect. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's what he's doing. So at the right time, Isaac leaves the well, heads up close to where they're going to be. That's God for you, isn't it? Yeah. And he went out in the field not to play <laughs> or to take a nap, but to meditate. Yeah. Uh -huh. And behold, something made him look up, see. He saw the camels. There were ten of them. Tear of ten camels. Saw them coming. Well, meditating does make you more uh, more alert. Then on the other end, Rebecca lifts up her eyes and she saw Isaac. She lighted off the camel, for she had. So before she got off the camel, she had said to the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant said, said It's my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself and she lit off at me. She jumped off the... Now, if you look at a camel, that, you're, you're sitting up there a little distance. She jumped off the camel. Now, there's a time to be hasty. Make haste. Remember when she did intuitively what Zacchaeus did by command. The Lord said, come, make haste and come down. She did it kind of. Now we're at the end of the journey. I don't, no need to be riding up here anymore. She got off immediately. What man is it, she asked. He, oh, here's the interesting thing. The man said, this is my master. Well, it was Isaac. And Abraham technically was his master. But Isaac being his sole heir, Isaac was his master too. Amen. It's the same situation with us. Amen. Christ is our master and God's our master. See, yeah. Because Jesus is the son of God, so whoever is subject to God is subject to his son also. It's the same same thing here. <laughs> and she covered herself with a veil. They still they still do this in the eastern countries as a sign of modesty. Here in America they take clothes off and then that part of the world they put them on. Interesting, isn't it? People say, Well it's hot. Well talk about hot. You haven't seen hot till you're in that part of the world. Parts I've been in were 130, 135, 140. But her veil. This veil was something that covered them, covered their face totally. The first thing that happens, the, the servant tells Isaac everything that he's done. He reports, makes a full report. The servant told Isaac all things that he had done. He must have repeated some of the prayers of thanksgiving he gave, you know, and this sort of thing. What a time it was. How that Abraham, maybe he had, maybe Isaac knew that Abraham told him, God will send his angel and lead you there. Yeah. And then the servant would say, well, he did. I was led there just like Abraham said. I led there and everything went just as God said. For I didn't have to pick from a variety of women. First stop, first woman, first house. Yeah. All there. Yeah. So he picked up on how quick all this was <laughs> That's right. moving along. He, he probably was eager to get back, saying that God was moving this pretty quick. He must have just been like bubbling up in him, huh? Uh, to yeah. report all this. Amen. I was interested in uh, something Albert Barnes, an uh, older commentator, said on this subject. All things were evidently done in the fear of God as became those who were to be the progenitors of the seed of promise. We have here a description of a primeval marriage. It is a simple taking of a woman for a wife before all witnesses and with suitable feelings and expression of reverence toward God and of desire for his blessing. It is a pure and holy relation reaching back into the realms of innocence and fit to be the emblem of the humble confiding affection, un, affectionate union between the Lord and his people. Well, I thought that's a very, very insightful remark. And he says, he just says he loved her. Now, it depends on how carnal a person is, what they read into that. 
I like to take it the way that he immediately was attracted to her and had an affection for her. She was beautiful. The scripture says she was beautiful. But the fact that she was God's choice, that's what endeared her to Isaac. This was, the, you must have been thinking, this is the Lord's doing. This is the woman God has brought to me. Now there's a kind of a secret divulged here concerning the rearing of children in the Lord. <clears throat> we talk about Isaac being reared in Abraham's house. And the servant being reared there as well. When a house is governed by an overriding and obvious devotion to the Lord and a consistency in deferring to the Lord at all times, <clears throat> Children are more likely to trust the Lord. Doesn't mean they, it doesn't mean they will. Cain didn't. He was raised the same way Abel was. Esau didn't. He was raised like Jacob was. Ishmael didn't. He was raised in Abraham's house, so he was a young man. There's no guarantee, but this is more apt to happen. Now, a lot of people try to raise children by strict routine. They have a routine. This is how they raise them by a routine. Now with children, you do have you do have to have some kind of routine, some kind of regimen, because they're in the process of learning. But over and above the routine, your life has got to bear an undiminished witness that you're living for God. There can be no question about this. And where you have children that are of an honest heart. And maybe you're a person that defers to other things, and you've got a reason for doing it. You say, I had to do this, I had to do that. Children are picking up on this. Yeah, that's right. You sure don't want Jesus to have a deep deference for somebody else when you call out on his name, do you? So that, that's, that's got to come across. And to be Isaac's demeanor tells you, just testifies to you the effect of living in Abraham's house. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Now his mother, his mother died when she was 127 years old. Isaac at this time is 40. Right? And he was born when she was 90. So that means Sarah had been dead for three years. Right? She'd been dead for three years, but she was such a godly woman. She had such strong faith and such resiliency that the impact of her life lasted for those three years. You want to be a, you want to have a life that has that kind of an effect. And Rachel now was a stepped in that stead to bring him a great great joy so he was comforted and whatever uh, you lose some of us have lost you know, mates and children and so forth but whatever you lose God will compensate you for it and some things you lose you don't always lose by death there's so the other ways you lose close associations, but you've got to believe this, that God will send something or someone along that will compensate. You can bank on that, brothers and sisters, you can bank on that. He'll send that to compensate for you. So that uh, that's the conclusion of this phase of Abraham's journey, and you see now he, he walked with Abraham all every step of the way, down to the finest detail, and if you get in the right path, there are some things that will happen that you could never make happen, but they'll, they'll happen. Yeah. I'll close there. Any of you have something you'd like to add tonight? I like that Rebecca was willing to go to a bridegroom whom she had not seen, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. but she had a, a, a token yeah. Amen. from him. Mm -hmm. Very real. Mm -hmm. Ooh, yeah. Having not seen. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs>
That's what it said of believers in Christ, whom have we not seen. So I'm giving, I like the point how you made of what you lose, God compensates for. I thought of the text, I, I, I don't know where it is, but the woman in travail with child she forgets all the anguish yeah. that she was having in the labor because the joy man, of a man mm -hmm. being born into the world That's right. mm -hmm. same thing same same thoughts can be applied here mm -hmm. yeah this is something too we probably ought to pick up through Genesis that God required Abraham to leave you know and yeah. Noah had to build an ark and focus on it and but all these people were compensated yeah. None of them were disadvantaged by what God asked them to do. Yes. Yeah, we, we know because it's in the scriptures that He told Abraham that He would bless them that blessed Him. Yeah. So this 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 family member, this yeah, section of the he, family, he <laughs> see they he, they he they didn't hold any regrets because Abraham left. It wasn't like they had hard feelings for Abraham. You could tell that the God had blessed them yeah. because they had blessed Abraham. He gave them gifts. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, this is this is a, 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 a picture here. You know, you how do you feel about the people of God? Because if you if you really do prefer the brethren, God will compensate you, and th things in your life. You know, they're. I'm not saying it's going to be an easy street, but he'll he'll bless you yes, he because will. you've blessed the brethren. Amen. Yes, Sister Tasha. I appreciate. Um, the faithfulness of this servant because it showed Rebecca and her family the faithfulness of the master. Yeah, he, was, right. he was faithful in this and you know whenever they asked for Rebecca to stay for 10 days his his concern was for his master. Amen. It wasn't for his own specific desire to return where he had come from but it was for the master and so that was a testimony to the family that what he was saying was true and what what he, what his master had to offer was substantial to her. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. Yes, yeah, Sister Nikki. I like this point that you brought out that when when Rebecca um, jumped off the camel, it was at the end of the journey. There was no reason to stay up there anymore. <laughs> it reminded me of you know, there's right now we're still like on a camel, so to speak. We're journeying through. Yes, there. right. But Amen. when the time comes for for us to see our bridegroom, we're going to jump off and we're not going to look back. We won't have to ask, who is this? <laughs> right. Amen. 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 Yes, we I made a reference, uh, it, actually I think it was your text last Sunday morning about having boldness in the day of judgment yes, because amen. as he is, so are we in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now this, this servant's conduct with his life was an example of what it means to be as to be as he is, yes. so are we Amen. in the world. His Amen. entire life was lived to fulfill the, the will of the master, of his master, which was Abraham. So that when he had done that, and he met with his master again, it was an occasion for anticipation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Kind of like those stewards yeah, of the goods right. of the Amen. Lord. See, they, they weren't hanging their heads in shame. They, they both came with an anticipation because they had been faithful. They had lived yeah. in order to be good yeah. stewards of the Master. So here we see a great incentive for faithfulness now so that we might be able to have boldness in the Day of Judgment as well. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes. I was thinking about this nurse too, how yeah. um, the body of Christ is like the nurse. That's right. Um, the, the Lord places each one yeah. in the body as, as He sees fit and so and, and together we build up the body yeah. so the nurse is willing to go with the body, you know, together. Yeah, amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she didn't ask why do we have to go yeah. to those other damsels. Yeah. As plural, so if the nurse, that's at least four women then, Rebecca the nurse and at least two other young women who are now in the charge of Abraham's servant who's got his servants, which is somewhere around 10 to 20. So he's got his responsibility increased as he went along. Go ahead, Brother Tony. You know, she wasn't assisted. You know, uh, she had a nurse and everything, but she jumped down off that camera. Yeah, that's right. You know, she, uh, Deborah, could you help me get down? Yeah. I mean, but she, she jumped and sat right down yeah, there. Uh, I was thinking about the account of the servant, though. Uh, almost flawless. I, know. I mean, he did everything just right. Uh -huh. And uh, and how that uh, he entered the work. Now we knew God was in this. He 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 was yeah. in it all the way. But still, they took all the camels. 
you know, and had loaded down with good stuff, and he was, and he gave out precious gifts, and they done what he needed to do, and even though God was still working, so it, it made me think, you know, how that we need to do everything you can do, you know, and uh, yeah. in in addition to God's work. Mm -hmm. And you had to have enough gifts taken off to make room for these four women to get on there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah with a mic. Appreciate the way the the servant uh, was his his mind was on uh, working for his master Abraham and looking for God's work. He was very the way he conducted himself was very uncomplicated. Mm -hmm. He yes, just he, he did exactly what Abraham told him to do. He and he sought God's face and everything. He he prayed unto the Lord and asked him how to direct him to Rebecca and when things began to fall into place he immediately recognized that it was mm -hmm. God uh -huh. and he worshiped. And I was thinking about you know all the different ways uh, he could have gone about finding Rebecca. You you could probably come up with dozens of ways he could have found her or tried to convince her to come back with him or things he would have told her or, but he, it was just very uncomplicated this is my business uh -huh. either you're in this or you're not uh -huh. and and you get the impression if, if she would have said no he'd have said farewell i'm uh -huh. heading back home that's it uh -huh. but and it's just i i desire to conduct myself that way I, Amen. You know, Amen. That'd, that'd be uh uh, that's a, a good way to live. Yeah. Just very Amen. uncomplicated, yeah. able to Amen. detect when the Lord's mm -hmm. working, yeah. Yeah. and just you know you're guided by His eye. Yeah. Uh -huh. Another thing, I I imagine that Isaac was very. We know the servant gave very detailed reports, oh, yeah. uh -huh. you know exactly what happened. So I imagine Isaac was very glad to hear that she said, "I will go." Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Without any convincing, just I will go. Amen. Were they given? Yes. When Isaac was, when he looked up and saw the camels coming, so much joy he would have had knowing that his bride was coming, or knowing that this, the expectation of a bride was coming, and so, and considering the Lord as well, how, when he knows it's time to go get his bride, how his expectation, his yes. joy will be full. Amen. He's expecting. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Mr. Melissa? Uh, how, uh, the servant was looking for Rebecca, but she was at the well. So, so you know, we we are to be found at the well. We'll be at the well. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. When you eat, you got to be at the right table. That's right. Amen. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this record and for the way it illuminates your own person and shows us the nature of your working and of your great salvation. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have visited us with salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.